So after listening to my bio being read by Mary Ellen there, it sounds like I can't hold a job. So um, thank you. I, I might have to reword that bio. Um, thank you very much for allowing me to be here this afternoon with you all. Um, as Mary Ellen stated, um, I have been with Morgan Stanley since 1996. Uh, and it's uh, not, not quite every day, but it's often when I'm asked why I'm with Morgan Stanley or where Morgan Stanley stands out. And I normally share, rather than tell you why I went to work at the Ritter with Morgan Stanley, I'd rather tell you why I stay. Um, and it is truly, uh, certainly we have got intellectual capital at our global firm. And um, our investment history in helping individuals achieve their financial goals speaks for itself. Uh, but more importantly, the dedication of its employees and our big fingers at the top of the organization to diversity, inclusion, and giving back um, is phenomenal. Um, Mary Ellen, did I say something? Um, as Mary Ellen said, um, I do cover a variety of different states and responsible for more than 2,300 financial advisors, basically starting from the state of North Carolina on the East Coast and going all the way down to Florida. And I just took a look at a few numbers before I walked in the room this morning, uh, just so I could get an idea of what our little group in Southeast has done locally, particularly here, because a lot of us are based out of Atlanta. Um, in 2014, um, our employees volunteered over 50,000 uh, hours to community work. Um, that includes going into Feeding America, working with our youth, truly giving back, not just with money, but with time. Um, and we also donated more than $6 million to 2,000 organizations worldwide, again, just within our Southeast region. And I'll tell you just about every manager that I'm associated with within our firm, we have a real focus on education and youth. And um, a, a wonderful woman who serves on our National Diversity Council with me shared her opinion on diversity and inclusion, which is diversity is being asked to uh, go to the party, being invited to the party. Um, inclusion is being asked to dance. And that is how we think um, in our little council. Um, on a personal note, I'd like to let you know I'm brand new to Atlanta. I literally just checked in not too long ago. So I know no one here, and if anybody is based in Atlanta, I am looking for new friends. Uh, so, you know, please come by me if for no other reason. Um, I have the distinct honor uh, and privilege of introducing our keynote this afternoon. Um, I normally would like to talk on the cuff um, and not physically read a bio, but given all of his accolades and everything that he's accomplished, I hope you'll forgive me because I don't want to miss anything. Um, over his long and distinguished career in medicine and health policy, Dr. Sullivan has championed efforts to overcome health disparities in the United States and to inspire students from minority populations to enter the scientific and healthcare profession. Early in his career, he served as the founding leader and first director of the Morehouse School of Medicine, the first medical school established at a historically black college in the 20th century. Um, later, as Secretary of Health and Human Services, um, he served in that position from 1989 to 1993. He led efforts to improve the health and health behaviors of all Americans through multiple public health strategies. Um, I also met Kim Egger in the lobby when I came in, and he gave me strict instructions that I must mention two things of personal note. One, five-year-old Dr. Sullivan decided at the age of five that he was going to become a doctor. Um, and that speaks to my heart because I have a six-year-old son who one moment wants to be a doctor, a fireman, um, a, a zookeeper, and, and to, to, to have been a little boy to say, I'm going to be a doctor and that's where I want to serve. Um, in addition to that, at the age of five, he really had a desire to possibly be a doctor in a rural area of Georgia because he wanted to give back to the community. But as Kim shared with me, he messed that all up and instead became the Secretary of Health and Human Services in the United States. And Kim said, so we'll forgive him because of how many lives he gives us a touch. Um, one other thing too to note is that Dr. Sullivan is a lifelong Republican. Um, he's very proud of that. But um, one thing that I got the sense of that he's even more proud is that he basically votes on the individuals and the principles, not the party. And as such, he is very, very much a supporter of affordable health care. Um, ladies and gentlemen, uh, again, it's just my honor to be at your table. Dr. Sullivan. Thank you very much for that generous introduction. It's my 
pleasure to be here uh, with the Fulbright Association and also as a native of Atlanta, having born, been born here at Grady Hospital uh, some 82 years ago, 1933, to welcome you to my city. As uh, you've heard, not only have I been a lifelong Republican, my father was a Republican because he and his generation identified the Republican Party as the party of Lincoln, who issued the Emancipation Proclamation. And when I was growing up, is that better? Can you hear me? Yeah. When I was growing up in Georgia, the people who were trying to prevent blacks from registering to vote were Democrats, because there was no effective Republican Party in Georgia. And among other things, my father joined with others to sue uh, the state of Georgia because of the white primary, which excluded blacks. Uh, while I was born in, here in Atlanta, we moved to southwest Georgia because having been born in 1933, that was the depth of the Depression. My father was a life insurance salesman for Atlanta Life Insurance Company, which itself has a remarkable story. A black-owned insurance company founded by Alonzo Herndon, whose parents were slaves. He was a barber for whites in downtown Atlanta. Blacks could not get insurance to, to bury their relatives or to get mortgages. So he formed what became the Atlanta Life Insurance Company and those of you who know Atlanta know that life, the Atlanta Life Insurance Company became the economic engine that uh, really developed the black community. Having uh, grown up here in the 40s and 50s, I can tell you that not only did Atlanta Life provide its own economic engine, but it, provide, it developed a number of other economic engines. There was a, a mutual federal, mutual uh, Federal Assurance Association, which was a mortgage company where blacks in the 40s could receive mortgages that they could not get from the white banks. There was Callaway uh, Insurance, a real estate insurance company, headed uh, by uh, uh, Mr. Callaway. And there were many other organizations uh, that uh, developed that were there around that time. So this city. Uh, has a, a well-known history as a civil rights center with Martin Luther King Jr., a Morehouse College uh, graduate, uh, and uh, many others, Brother Joseph Lowry, many, many others. But the economic strength as well as the political strength in the black community has made this a special uh, city. Well, as you've heard, um, while I was born here, my family moved to Southwest Georgia because nobody was buying life insurance in 1933. They were trying to put food on the table or stay in their houses and so have money to pay the rent. So my father moved to Southwest Georgia and established the first black funeral home in Blake, in the town of Blake. But in addition to that, because of his political activism, he founded the first chapter of the NAACP uh, in that uh, city, worked to get uh, blacks the right to vote, started an annual Emancipation Day celebration on January 1st of every year. We would have parades, speeches uh, by black leaders, John Wesley Dobbs, the grandfather of Lena Jackson, our first black mayor of the city, and, and others. And he sued the uh, school system uh, because of facilities and Southwest in Lakeview, Georgia, as in all of Georgia, the educational facilities for, for blacks were certainly separate, but far from equal. Well, my parents were role models for me and my older brother. And among other things, they were strongly committed to education. Because my father was a mortician, he also provided ambulance services for blacks in the community. And what led to me wanting to be a doctor was the fact that uh, quite frequently my father would take uh, a black citizen of Georgia down to Bainbridge, Georgia, 
some Puerto Mal South to be seen by Dr. Joseph Griffin. Dr. Griffin was the only black physician in, in southwest Georgia, south of Columbus, all the way to the Florida border, or west of Albany, Georgia, uh, from Albany uh, to the Alabama border. So I would ride down with my father, and here was this man who was about six feet two, wearing green scrubs. He had built his own brick clinic, the 25 beds. He'd opened the door, there was the, the pungent smell of ether because he also did surgery and delivered babies, etc. And he really, for me, was a magician because he could cure people. He had a knowledge base uh, and a capability that others did not have. That's why I wanted to be a doctor. I wanted to be like Dr. Griffin. Highly respected, very successful, indeed uh, a leader in his own, uh, in his own uh, activities. Well, I did become a doctor. My parents uh, sent my brother and me when I was in fifth grade, and my brother was in sixth grade, first to Savannah to live with relatives so that we could attend schools in Savannah rather than in rural Georgia, where the schools were really awful for blacks. The following year, they uh, sent us back to Atlanta. And while uh, they were living in Blakely, I, my brother and I finished high school here uh, in at Atlanta, the Book of Washington High School. At that time, Book of Washington High School was the only high school for blacks in Atlanta. It just not too long ago celebrated its 90th uh, anniversary as the first public high school for blacks in the state of Georgia. It was founded in 1924. So I point this out to say that uh, we, I think we've made tremendous progress, but it really has been a relatively short time. And the changes that have occurred uh, all over the country, but certainly in the South, have been truly remarkable. I finished Morehouse College in 1954, the same year of Brown versus Board of Education decision, uh, declaring that segregated schools were inherently unequal and therefore unconstitutional. I went to Boston University to medical school because by law I could not attend medical schools in Georgia. 21 years later, I returned to Georgia in 1975 to found the Morehouse School of Medicine. Several things made that possible. The most prominent was the Civil Rights Movement with all of the activities of the students in Greensboro, North Carolina, who sat in at the lunch counters demanding to be served, by the marchers in Mississippi, uh, who pointed out to the whole nation the injustice of segregation, etc. But what makes this nation great is the fact that people listened and they responded. And when I returned to Atlanta in 1975, not only were the black physicians in the state supportive of the Baltimore schools, the white positions were also supportive. And that included them going with me to meet with the government to solicit state support for the institution, testifying before committees of the legislature. Our congressman at that time was Andy Young. He took me to Washington uh, to introduce me to our Senate, two senators, Herman Talbot, our senior senator, uh, Sam Nunn, our junior senator. Growing up in Georgia, Herman Talmadge was the governor of Georgia who made his political career with such statements as segregation yesterday, segregation today, and segregation tomorrow. So you can imagine uh, my uh, uncertainty when I was going to meet his son, now I'm a senior senator. Well, we formed a very good relationship because he, at that time, was chairman of, of the Senate Agriculture Committee. And every state in the nation has its own agricultural industry. So they gave Herman Talmadge great political sway. That meant that almost every senator would need, need his help on some agricultural issue in his state. And in return, of course, he would cash in those uh, uh, political chips for things that he wanted. So while he was not on any of the health committees in the Senate, uh, his uh, 
support for our activities meant that we were listened to very carefully by the Civic Committee on Health, uh, Education, and other uh, agencies. So I returned to a different Georgia in 1955 than I had left in 1954. Indeed, uh, both Herman Thomas and Sam Nunn became members of our board of the medical school. Uh, and uh, because of Andy Young's uh, uh, introduction and his support, uh, we got uh, their support for federal uh, grants for our institution. I won't give you a detailed history of our medical school except to say that there were 47 new medical schools created in the United States in the second half of the 20th century that added to the 80 medical schools that existed in 1950. In 1950, of those 80 schools, two were predominantly African-American, Howard in Washington, D.C., and Harry in Nashville, Tennessee, both formed uh, in the 19th century. So of the 47 schools that opened between 1956 and 1981, one uh, of those schools was predominantly African American, that is, more of school medicine. But I say predominantly because we've been integrated since we opened with our first class in 1978. Not only black students, but Hispanic students, white students, uh, students from abroad, because our unifying theme is training health professionals who will provide care to, the, to those who have been on the margins of society the poor, as well as uh, minorities. Well, let me um, come to the remarks that I really uh, want to share with you today. And they really are, I uh, chose the title of Challenges and Opportunities in Global Health. And when I say global health, I include the United States because we are part of uh, the nations in the globe. In the United States, we've had remarkable improvements in the health of Americans throughout the course of the 20th century. Noted by the fact that life expectancy for an infant born in, the, in 1900 was some 47 years, whereas today life expectancy for an infant born in America is approaching 80 years. Deaths uh, from Americans in the early part of the 20th century included such things as tuberculosis, smallpox, polio, pneumonia, and a number of other infectious diseases. But today, smallpox has been eliminated not only from the United States, but from the world. I think you heard, those of you who heard the session yesterday, heard about the work that led to the eradication of smallpox and the health of them and economic advantages uh, from that. We're close to eliminating polio from the world. Not quite there. Very difficult to get those last vestiges um, of uh, polio eliminated. But as was pointed out yesterday, it's not for medical reasons, but for political, uh, economic, uh, uh, political or military reasons and misunderstandings. In the northern parts of Nigeria, in Pakistan, uh, Afghanistan, where war uh, and civil unrest is there, difficult to get vaccine there, as well as some misunderstanding because of the fear, certainly in northern Nigeria, of the population that this vaccine is really something designed to sterilize their uh, girls so that they will not be able to have children. Nothing could be further from the truth, but. When misinformation gets around in the population, it is very difficult uh, to correct that. So, so, so that is the reason it's there. But we have made significant improvements in the health of, of Americans so that uh, we are much healthier today than we were 100 years ago. That's because of improvements in our public health system so that we take for granted the presence of safe drinking water, uh, nutritious food. We have had the marvelous introduction of many vaccines. When I was a medical student in the mid-50s, I took care of patients with paralytic polio, often uh, 
with their respiratory muscles paralyzed from this virus, they had to be put in iron lungs uh, so they could breathe. And when the Salk and Sabin vaccines were introduced uh, in the mid-50s, overnight, things changed. One year, an epidemic of polio with many people uh, paralyzed uh, from this uh, uh, infection. The next year, very few cases. And so that is what led to the movement to try and eradicate this uh, disease from the world. And if and when we succeed, that will be the second disease that will have been eliminated uh, from, from uh, uh, the world. The scientific base for medicine improved throughout the 20th century. That was given great momentum by the report of Dr. Abraham Flexner in 1910, who looked at medical education in the United States and Canada. Some of you will be surprised to know that in 1910, a number of medical schools would admit students who did not even have a high school diploma. Many of these were trained schools, uh, taught, being taught by a physician at, with the school being a privately owned entity. Very little in the way of organized curriculum, nothing in the way of accreditation of schools. Well, the, the Carnegie Foundation, because of their interest in education, asked Dr. Flexner to survey medical education uh, in our country, because at that time, leadership in medical education was not in the United States, it was Europe. Centers such as Heidelberg, London, Edinburgh, Bologna, uh, these were considered the peak uh, of, of education, where prestigious medical professors resided. Well, Flexner issued his report, and in my city of Atlanta, we had five medical schools uh, in 1908 when Dr. Flexner started this survey of all medical schools in the country. Because he was sponsored by the Carnegie Foundation, he was welcomed at all of these places, and he visited every last school. His report was titled Medical Education in the United States and Canada. Uh, that report, when it uh, uh, was issued in 1910, Stung the medical education establishment because of its strong critique. The, he felt that the model for medical education should be one like Johns Hopkins Medical School. Because Hopkins required its uh, applicants to have at least a high school diploma and preferably one or two years of college education. The Hopkins medical curriculum included. Uh, Courses in anatomy, physiology, uh, pathology, etc. And the sciences basic to medicine was given during the first two years, followed by two additional years of clinical instruction. So uh, today in medical education, we still hear the term Flecknerian model of medical education, which, which applies to, oops. <laughs> was modeled after that of John Hopkins. Because of the severity of this critique, by 1925, the 148 medical schools in the United States and Canada <coughs> had been reduced to 80. The five medical schools uh, in Atlanta, by 1925, had been reduced to one. The Atlanta School of Medicine merged with the Atlanta Medical College in 1912, and in 1914, it became affiliated with Emory University. And Emory Medical School today is the surviving institution from that. The College of Physicians and Surgeons of Atlanta went out of business as did two other schools. That was a phenomenon that is going on all over uh, the United States. Accreditation for medical schools began in the mid teens. And by the middle of the 20th century, we could say with confidence that the United States had the strongest medical education system of any country, very different from the beginning of the 20th century. 
We also have had improvements because of the strength of our science uh, uh, in health. The National Institutes of Health came into being uh, in the late 40s and had become the uh, source for research dollars supplying uh, support to scientists at our nation's universities, hospitals, research institutes, and health profession schools. As a result of our support of science, we can say that throughout the course of the 20th century, more Nobel Prizes in physiology and medicine have come to scientists in American laboratories than in the rest of the world combined. So today, we are very different from the situation that existed 100 years ago. Strong science, strong health professions education, and we spend more dollars in our health system than anyone else. But with all of that, we're not the healthiest nation on Earth. Why is that? And I say uh, simply it's because we have a distribution problem. We've not been uh, fortunate or wise enough to develop a system that, see, that sees that everyone gains full access to the benefits of the system that we have established. When I went to Washington in 1989, I was concerned that some 37 million Americans did not have health insurance. We developed uh, a proposal to address that, uh, but for a variety of political reasons, that uh, proposal never saw the light of day. Some of them were internal to the administration, but others were external. The internal reasons were by May of uh, 1991, we had a proposal to reform the health care system. But May 1991 was after the Gulf War uh, was over. President Bush's ratings were 90, 91%. So I was told by uh, the staff at the White House, Lou, let's wait until after the election, because health is a difficult issue, controversial, and you never know how things will turn out. So we don't want to do anything that would endanger the president's uh, rankings. Well, that turned out to be a mistake, because you may remember that uh, in November of 91, Dick Thornburg, who had been the uh, Attorney General of the George Bush, H.W. Bush, ran for the Senate seat that uh, Jack Hines had held. And of course, he was killed in an unfortunate airplane accident. His opponent was Harris Walker, who made a point of pushing for a national health insurance program. To everyone's surprise, he won. So I then received a call from the White House saying, Lou, where's that the health program that uh, you did? <laughs> That, that uh, health uh, proposal was introduced by President uh, Bush at the Cleveland City Club in February of 1992. So now we move into the political season, a Republican administration with the Democratic Congress. While we sent the bill up uh, to the Hill, it was never reported out of committee because now the political environment has taken over and uh, Democratic Congress did not want to give a Republican president an advantage uh, in terms of such, such an issue. So that died in committee. But I can tell you that a number of features of the Affordable Care Act, the features that were in yeah. that plan, yeah. which are just a little ironic as well as amusing because uh, they, many of the features that have been criticized by uh, my Republican colleagues uh, in the Congress. The state health insurance exchanges, we had group purchasing uh, cooperatives to allow people to get insurance uh, who had difficulty uh, getting <coughs> mandatory uh, mandates that we had to buy insurance so that we would not have adverse selection because if, uh, if you have uh, a system without that, the fear is that only people who have illness or uh, problem will purchase insurance and people who are healthy, uh, he will not, and therefore, uh, the insurance industry will be destabilized uh, by that. And a number of other uh, features, including greater funds for health promotion, disease prevention activities, or health education. 
And of course, uh, the Affordable Care Act was modeled after the Massachusetts uh, health bill yep. that was enacted when uh, Mitt Romney was the Republican governor of Massachusetts. So, uh, indeed, well, there, where there are some differences, there are many, many similarities. When the Affordable Care Act was uh, implemented, we actually had 47 million Americans without insurance, 10 million more than in 1989, which shows that in spite of the economic uh, growth of the 90s, this did not reduce the number of people without uh, health insurance. We have to find incentives uh, to be sure that the people do uh, purchase the insurance. Well, the Affordable Care Act, uh, while it is certainly not perfect, and one of the criticisms, uh, of course, was the fact that when the insurance exchanges were implemented, uh, uh, there were many technical problems. I think the administration, uh, President Obama and his colleagues, made the error of not preparing the nation for the fact that there could be technical problems. I finished uh, a, a, an eight-year uh, uh, experience on the board of Grady Hospital. During that time, we shifted to an electronic health records system, uh, put in by a technical company doing the electronic records that had much experience. And when they flipped the switch, after spending uh, several million dollars on it, it didn't work. <laughs> it took about a year or more for that uh, system to really be implemented. This was really not a new system, it was in a new, lo new location. Uh, well, those technical uh, glitches uh, have been indeed addressed, and of course uh, the system is working well. So as a result of the Affordable Care Act, with its various features, we have 17 million people who now have health insurance who did not have it uh, before. We still have a lot of work to do because um, we started out with, with 47 million uninsured. We have many more who really should be insured. But it will take really a number of years for us to reach uh, that optimal state. So that uh, that is uh, something that really is a decades long challenge for us to, to address. But some of the features of the uh, Affordable Care Act include having young adults uh, remain on their parents' insurance up to age 26, expansion of the Medicaid program, and I'm uh, uh, not happy that a number of governors, including my governor of Georgia, have chosen not to expand <coughs> Medicaid, saying that we can't afford it. Well, uh, of course, my question is, what is the purpose of government if we're not working to improve the lives uh, of, of people. I had an editorial a year ago, uh, a little more than a year ago, in our local newspaper, the Atlanta Journal Constitution, pointing out that Georgia uh, was not expanding Medicaid, whereas Arkansas and Kentucky, two states with per capita income lower than that of Georgia, could afford it, and they were effectively <coughs> expanding Medicaid. It's really yeah. helping to see that those citizens really uh, are healthier, able to work, <coughs> earn wages, support their families, um, and be less uh, needy for social support services. Uh, so, uh, so there are many uh, advantages that have occurred because of that. Also, making sure that there's not adverse selection, preventing insurance companies from excluding people for pre-existing uh, conditions. So I think the Affordable Care Act, while far from perfect, and one can easily uh, pick out a number of features that, uh, uh, it, that are not well addressed, and I think one of them has been really the malpractice crisis uh, that we have now, where many physicians and hospitals uh, and other health professionals will order tests, not because they feel they're medically necessary, but for fear if there should be some adverse outcome that uh, they will be, be sued. One of the features of the, of the bill that we had proposed was to have a no-fault uh, um, medical malpractice system, meaning if there is an adverse outcome, an expert panel, a series of panels around the country, would be to review that, determine if this uh, is a fault of the procedure, 
uh, or the people who did it, and if so, what is the injury, and then have payment for, for that uh, to, to cover that, as well as punitive damages if indeed there's, there is obvious uh, poor practice uh, of, the health, of the health professions. Well, I'm sure that as time passes, we will improve the health, uh, uh, the Affordable Care Act, so that it will indeed function better uh, with each each coming year. But our nation is undergoing uh, some significant demographic <coughs> changes. Among the uh, reasons that Morehouse School of Medicine was formed was the shortage of black physicians in the state of Georgia. Two percent of the physicians in Georgia. Uh, in the 70s uh, were African-American, with the population in Georgia of 28% African-American. Now, in the nation more broadly today, one-third of uh, Americans are members of minority group, either Latino, African-American, or Native American. And the Census Bureau has projected that uh, with the demographic changes underway in our society today, by the year 2042 or 2043, there will no longer be a white majority population. So the rationale for having a more diverse health workforce is there uh, because a number of studies have shown that when there's alignment between uh, the physician, uh, the other, other health professional, and the patient, indeed, the patient is more comfortable. Uh, is more willing to share confidential or potentially embarrassing information, uh, and therefore the health uh, exchange is, is much more, more positive. So we need to work to increase diversity uh, in our nation's workforce, not only uh, more our school of medicine, but all medical schools working to increase uh, the number of Latino, uh, African American, uh, Native American uh, uh, physicians. As I uh, mentioned, the U.S. is part of the world, and we have, I believe, a responsibility with our, with our philosophy of self-improvement uh, and support, being supportive of each other, of working to help uh, other nations improve their health. We know in the, uh, on the African continent, for example, it has been estimated that some 25% of the burden of disease uh, or injury is in Africa, but only two to three percent of the health professionals in the world are in Africa. And we've seen recent examples of uh, how that plays out with the Ebola uh, crisis that was in West Africa uh, over the past uh, two years. I can tell you that in, 19, in 2013, there were 175 physicians in Liberia in a country of four million people. And with the ravages from the Ebola uh, epidemic, that number is now less, less than one hundred. One medical school in that country uh, and a shortage of personnel as well as uh, facilities. So clearly, organizations like the Fulbright Association with the programs that you support can be helpful to our colleagues and other nations in Africa, Asia, South America, or, or else, elsewhere. Two, two examples of activities with which we've been involved uh, uh, in our own way to address that. In 1985, I was part of a group that formed an organization called Medical Education for South African Blacks. This organization was formed by a couple, Herb and Joy Kaiser, in Washington, D.C. Herb had been a career uh, a diplomat in the U.S. Foreign Service, and he retired in 1983. And like uh, all of us in our uh, country now, uh, of course, uh, 65 uh, is the new 40. So Herb, <laughs> Herb being quite, and his wife Joy being quite uh, robust, very healthy, Herb had served in South Africa. He knew, uh, he was uh, familiar with the black consciousness movement, knew people such as Steve Biko and many others they are working to roll back apartheid. And as all of you are aware, apartheid 
was beginning to be demanded by the beginning of the 80s. Blacks were beginning to be admitted to white universities. There was a shortage of scholarship support. So this organization was formed in 1985, and I was pleased to be invited to serve as one of the directors. Its purpose was to provide funding, scholarship funding, for black health professions students. In a country with uh, more than 40 million uh, South African blacks, there were less than 200 black physicians <laughs> in South Africa. The organization, uh, uh, our board consisted of both Americans and South Africans. The purpose was to provide scholarship support to students who were being educated in South Africa. Uh, we did this by raising funds, uh, by direct solicitation, as well as by honoring outstanding Americans uh, or South Africans at an annual dinner uh, in New York. Uh, and I can uh, tell you that uh, over a period from 1985 to 2008, where we raised approximately a million dollars a year with this organization, we provided scholarship support for more than 10,000 South Africans, medical, nursing, dental, veterinary medical, and other health professionals. By the year 2008, uh, we put the organization down because with the change in government and government policies, there was less need for our organization. And we also found that our expenses were increasing, whereas our revenues were, were not. So we felt that we would uh, declare victory uh, and close the organization uh, down. But today, many physicians uh, and nurses and other health professionals in South Africa are familiar with uh, this organization that works with all of the medical schools, nursing schools, and other health profession schools in, in South Africa. At Morehouse School of Medicine, we uh, received support from USAID to develop a training program in the village of Fati. Senegal, some 40 miles from the capital of the Kama. This program was designed to have Western-trained uh, Senegalese physicians work with traditional healers in Senegal. Shortage of health personnel uh, and uh, also the, tr the traditional healers were heavily, were highly regarded by the population. So the purpose of this program was to increase the communication between these traditional healers and other physicians to improve the quality of care provided by the traditional healers because it had been projected to be decades before Senegal had enough uh, physicians from the medical schools in that country who would be providing care to the people uh, in, in Senegal. And that operation went on several decades and has helped to improve the quality of care given to people in uh, Senegal by traditional healers as well as uh, physicians. By addressing uh, health issues such as this, we not only provide a humanitarian benefit uh, to our colleagues in, in other countries, we also help them strengthen their workforce to improve their productivity and have and, and indirectly improve their economy. That comes back to us in several ways because as a capitalistic uh, uh, nation with our economy, uh, much of our benefit comes from our trading markets. So if we have healthy nations, prosperous nations with which to trade, this helps us here. We also want to be sure that the rest of the world sees our country as more than a military power but also as a humanitarian uh, country uh, that is willing to work with people to help them address the needs uh, in their own countries, as, including the need to get develop those skills that will make them self-sufficient. So with those kinds of activities, which the Fulbright Association uh, supports, I say that you are doing not only exciting work, but important work that will change the world that will improve the lives of people as well as to change the image of our country 
in, in, around the world to those who are less fortunate than we. So with that, let me say thank you.